Hi everyone, this is Al McKay. Welcome to episode 121. I'm speaking with Sergio Paez, a director at Lucasfilm. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. All right. So again, apologies. I still have my cold <laughs> as I'm recording this. I've, I'm batching my uh, recordings at the moment. So um, yeah, I'm a little bit nasally right now. Forgive me. Oh, by the way, I just got to quickly say Happy New Year. It's the second today. So uh, I hope you're very hungover still. Uh, no, I don't. But I, I do hope that you had an amazing New Year's. And I hope that you have a chance to really reflect on the past year and a lot of your wins and also areas that you might need to focus more on. So again, Happy New Year. But um, this episode is going to be really cool. I'm speaking with Sergio Paez, a good buddy of mine, very talented, and um, works for Lucasfilm on the Star Wars Clone Wars show, as well as um, working on a lot of other really cool projects as well. So uh, I had a blast talking to Sergio just because it let me have a lot of insights into his process and a lot of his background. And he shared a lot of really great information. What I loved about both... Justin Gobi, which was uh, last week and this week was with Sergio, is that both of these guys do a lot of training as well. And I think that that has really helped them really be amazing communicators. They're really able to share a lot of information and they have that real urge to help other people. And um, yeah, I, I think in general, like it's just really amazing to see a lot of these guys who are in the industry, um, like myself, who love to share information and to help others and really kind of see a lot of growth in other people. So um, this is really cool to chat with Sojo. I'd like to just dive right into this episode. I will quickly mention that we do have that free training still available for a little bit more time. This is something that I worked on for weeks uh, and I'm loving it. I'm loving what everyone's been doing with it. Um, so far, there's been about 20,000 people who've been going into this training. It's been pretty crazy. Um, if you want to check it out, it's basically a live action visual effects shot that I've gone through, taking the shot from start, all the way to finish, uh, creating a lot of uh, digital effects such as fluid simulations, um, digital makeup such as this guy's face decaying, uh, as well as a lot of other mist effects and other things like that, as well as compositing and finishing the shot. Um, check it out at alanmckay.com slash decay, so D-E-C-A-Y. Check it out there. And um, if you want to check out the show notes, simply go to alanmckay.com slash 121 for episode 121. And uh, you can check out links to Sojo's website and other good stuff, as well as uh, to some of the other great things we've got going on. And in addition, obviously, uh, show notes and key quotes and other things like that. So that being said, uh, let's dive into this episode. Again, I apologize for being so nasally. Okay. So I'm Sergio Paez. I'm an animation director. I've been in story development and the story departments of different animation studios over the years. And I've kind of focused my career now into doing that. So I, I develop stories, I work on stories, and now at the moment I'm working at Lucasfilm on the Rebels Animated Series and another undisclosed project that they're doing. And it's been, it's been awesome. I, I love what I do, and I think that if once you get the bug of storytelling and developing this stuff, you never go back. That's awesome, man. That's really cool. And uh, I always do this, but like, how did you get started in the beginning? Like, did you always think that you're going to be an artist or, you know, you want to be a lawyer or a doctor and then later on it's like, fuck it, break, break out the pencils? Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I've, I've met people like that. I find that awesome story, how they, they make the transition. But really, I, I when I was a kid, I just loved watching animated films. I loved movies. And I loved to draw. I, was, I wasn't really that good at it, but I knew kind of once I found out that other people did this, that this was like something you could make a living at. I, I just tried to pursue it. And, you know, as a kid, you know, you get kind of distracted by other things. But that was the one thing, the one thread that kept, that I kept was just art and drawing. So I, I went to art school, like out of high school, I went to art school in San Francisco um, and I studied there for four years. I kind of did the illustration and animation program, which, you know, some of it was good. I learned a lot. I learned actually how to draw in like classical 
you know, figure drawing, anatomy, that kind of stuff. And then I learned a little bit about animation. So the storytelling part, which I really dig, actually felt like I didn't get that much out of it. It was when I really landed my first gig Mm -hmm. that that education started to take off. So I kind of went the traditional artist route. So just to dive in for a second, but um, yeah, that's something I kind of find interesting too, is I think that we all go to school expecting that that's prepare us to know everything we need to know to go in the workforce. But it's, as you said, it's usually when you get into the workforce, um, you use everything that you've got so far just to make that first step and actually get break into the, and then from there, the real schooling, the real learning actually begins. And like for you, like, was that pretty accurate? Like, did you kind of find Man, that? Absolutely. I think at a school, because you're in this smaller group, you think you're hot shit or maybe you have a good portfolio or something mm-hmm. and you think you can get a job. And then when you actually get the job, you find out, wow, these guys are actually really awesome and I really suck. <laughs> and I need, there's a lot I need to learn, which was especially, okay, so I maybe I learned a little bit about animation and so maybe I could somewhat hold my own and make things animate because I started out as a 2D animator. But when I started doing storyboards and elaborating story stuff, that was when the rude awakening happened. <laughs> Some of like the supervisors came down, look at my shots, like, no, 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 no. You got to do it like this. And that was when my eyes just opened up big. And I, I really, it was like, this juicy knowledge that I needed to learn. Uh, cool. Fortunately, yeah, those guys were very generous and they kind of guided me along. That's really cool. And um, so where was the first place you worked? Like, what did, how did you get your first big break? Uh, I, I landed a job at Wild Brain, which is a local animation studio in San Francisco at the time. Uh, it, 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 it no longer exists in the form that it was back then. Now I think it's in L.A. and they do some other development work. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was a really, like, bustling animation studio. Like, uh, yeah, they were doing a ton of projects. So it was cool to meet all the local talent that was working in animation already in San Francisco. And yeah, that was it. That and they, they like, uh, I got like kind of a pseudo internship. It was very entry level. And I was so happy to just be making money. I thought it was the greatest thing ever. <laughs> I was getting paid I, I, like pennies. I wasn't getting paid very much, but to be there, to be among other creative people was just, just like, yeah, it was fabulous. It was like the dream come true. I couldn't believe that I was actually doing it. Yeah, was that like a ride into storyboarding or did you... Were you doing no, so that was that was 2D animation, which is right. basically what I was doing. And I, I had a portfolio together from school, like, you know, collected drawings and illustrations that I did. I showed it to these guys. They gave me a chance, basically. It wasn't really that pro looking back on what I had. <laughs> and uh, I guess, you know, they, they saw that I could do some things and they gave me that shot. And I knew I wanted to get into storyboarding. So once I was in that... Uh, that animation studio, they, you know, I was kind of asking around to see how I could do it. Uh, that job, that first job didn't last very long. It was only, uh, I think it was like six months or, or less. And um, it was project based. And so then I bounced to different other illustration things. When I, I ended up moving to, to Spain for, I was just traveling at one point. And then I, over there, because uh, another friend gave me the tip, there was an animation studio looking for artists. So since I was there, I was like, okay, well, I'll just try it out. I went and visited them, and they were doing a feature. So, uh, I guess that was Ilian? Uh, no, no, this was back in the day. It's called Animagic Studios at the oh, time. Animagic, now, now, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. now it's Spa Studios that's run by Sergio Pablos. Cause, sorry, I was, just, I was just thinking, like, you know, there's not that many animated features coming out of Spain, but fuck. Yeah, that's, so we're going way back. Yeah, this is yeah. way back. This is before <laughs> Liam, and I remember when those guys started up, too, because it's a small world, right? I knew those guys. Uh, I can't remember any of them now, but, like, back in the day, um, because, again, like, they're they're using 3DS Max, I think, for yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so it was such a small world back then, but that's cool. And so what was that experience like then? It was awesome because that was the first, you know, I, I applied as, actually as a 2D animator. That was like my thing. I, the reason I signed up for that gig is because 2D animation jobs were going away in the United States and everything was turning to 3D, which I just wanted to hold on to those roots. So I got that gig and, uh, you know, fortunately I did a test, <laughs> I did a really bad animation test. I remember that, but anyway, they gave, they gave me a shot and I guess I could uh, hold my own, but there are these old, uh, like, European Disney animators and people from other places that just came back and they, they were really good and talented. And uh, they also needed story guys to elaborate the story before animation. So I was, I actually got hired before they, cause I had to read, it was a big mess, but they redid the project at a point. And so I jumped on as a story artist and that was like my first real chance at doing storyboards. And that's when I got the rude awakening and be like, all right, this, I have to step it up. 
mm-hmm. and I learned so much from these guys. It was it was really awesome. That's cool, really cool. And I guess for you, like I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but what specifically kind of gravitates you towards storyboarding over other areas of film? I mean, there, there's a couple components that I really like. One is it's like the technical part is I can still use my drawings and practice my illustration style. But the other one that I think you know I'll, I'll admit to guiltily is that you, you have a lot of control mm-hmm. in just the conceptualization and the idea part that you're really in the driver's seat of taking the pieces of the story and constructing it and you move it around and you can change it and you really do have a lot more uh let's say freedom than an animator would coming from that sense because animators are the shot and they can do amazing shot and they can also do storytelling within that shot but as a whole, a story guy can do a sequence, and then eventually you can do a couple of sequences and you'll string together maybe an act. And then if you actually get to direct, you can do the whole thing and the whole show, and you edit. And it's to me that experience is just so exciting. It's when you see something develop like that, it's really cool. And even if it's bad, it's like okay, how do we <laughs> fix it? Because a lot of times you're fixing story problems and you're reboarding stuff because it's never right the first time. That I think is is what really that's the bug that really sticks in. <laughs> oh shit! I can actually do this and make this my own. You know, that's so cool. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a few traditional paths to directing, but you know, I've I found a lot of the time that doing previs or doing storyboarding, those are two ways that you work closely with the director. You're you've got a lot of say uh, over you know the initial uh, ideas and concepts of you know any film project or the project you're doing. So um, bit by bit, you're kind of getting that experience. Um, you know, also getting uh, FaceTime with the director, which is huge as well. So that's really cool. Yeah, not not people, not many people know that. Like, I, I guess people in the industry, you would obviously know that that you know development and story previs are all like the start of a project and i find that it's just it's it's that it's that you get to work with the director the producer the writer everybody at the very beginning and you're developing the project along with them and that you have to make these like very executive creative decisions right like Mm -hmm. oh are we going to use this crane shot are we going to do like this epic thing oh no it's going to be a little more calm and that kind of stuff is so so much fun and if you can see it all the way through, you, you see the end product too, which is, which is awesome. I, I guess one of the key things, though, is you got to learn to let go of your work too. You can't be, um, you, can't, <laughs> you can't hold on to things like, no, I, I, I spent too much time on this. We're sticking with this frame. So <laughs> yeah, I, that, that's another like lesson, life lesson. You're like, oh, you know what? I, you know, you, you get so uptight about your work. You go, why, why did you change this? I had this right. And then you look at the film and like, oh, no, actually, they made the right decision. And you have to, like, let go sometimes. <laughs> That's cool. And for you, I guess, like, um, going through a few of your projects, but was Dark Watch one of your first big projects? What was one Yeah, of the actually, <laughs> Dark Watch, that's a, yeah. I've actually got the, uh, the artwork. I've got the art book for that. Like, um, oh, right. cool. Yeah, I picked up a comic book store, I think, when I first moved to L.A. or something. But, yeah, it's cool. Nice. Yeah, that was a fun project. Yeah, I think... Uh, that, I mean, that was my biggest like video game project that and I, you know, at, when I was doing that, I, I got a little more into uh, like supervising in a way. I guess they let me kind of I was in charge of the storyboards at that point, And there was like maybe another artist. And, and so they just let me go. I was the first guy there. So they basically just let me let me do it and at your seniority sake or whatever. But um, the art director there was awesome. And, and we all did that. So that yeah, that kind of like wet my appetite with uh okay, I can really, I can take more control. Maybe I'm just a little control freak. So I don't like do this, but it was super fun. Yeah. That's cool. That's really cool. And um, like for you, I guess, being one of the earlier projects, like what were some of the challenges you ran into on that job? On Dark Watch, it was definitely the the story development. I remember it was, they, we never, because the Dark Watch, if, for those of you who don't know, it's like this. I, I know nothing about it. I just picked up the book because the artwork was amazing. But ah, okay. Now, now I got to go back and look at the the storyboards. It's kind of like a vampire yeah, hunter yeah. that you know that it's trying to. He's a, he's a, he's a good guy, right? And that that story didn't exactly develop. The, the gameplay was was awesome, and they're they're still they're making that part. But that was the one thing that we kept redoing and redoing and redoing, and it, it got to the point where like, oh man, we actually have to release this thing. So we did a bunch of versions. And that was the real challenging part of like, oh, okay, how do we actually make this thing? And the timeline kept shrinking. So we had to like redo it and produce it. So really, I think it came out all right. There's, you know, everybody can critique their own work later. But I think that pressure sometimes helps, helps like ignite creativity. Mm-hmm. So I think it was, uh, it was that that really, you know, it's another like lesson to learn that working under those conditions 
can actually be po a positive thing than um, always thinking, oh, yeah, you need the, the perfect environment to create your artwork, right? That's right. And yeah, I mean, I'm the same way. Like I prefer and like, producers love this, but I'm always like I prefer doing stressful 9-11 jobs. For me, I love bouncing around and putting out fires rather than, you know, I always think of Superman was probably the longest project I've been tied to where I was involved um, in pre-production, the shoot, and then when went into actual production and then like all the posts and everything after that. And yeah, I, I just got bored because you, you got this infinite loop where I ended up quitting the job for about a year just because um, I get to see what was happening where we had a year and a half before the movie is going to come out. Well, great. That means that we need to do this. Okay, we did it. Let's try a different version of it, a different version. Just have fun experimenting. And for me, I'm like, no, I, I, I want the light at the end of the tunnel. I, I want those compacted deadlines. And I do feel that when you, you have those deadlines lingering, that's when the decisions you could be making months or years before that, you know, you're able to, have to make those on the spot. And I think a condensed um, timeline allows you to do that, you know, just make the right calls right away. Yeah, it's like good habit forming. I mean, I, 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 I that comparison I, I made me think of like TV deadlines, like TV show deadlines versus feature deadlines. And yeah, it, it feels like, because I'm working on a TV show now. So like everything is just go, 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 do this. All right, decision, let's done. All right, okay, let's change it, move, boom, right? And then a feature, it feels like, oh, you get all this time up front. <laughs> and then that, yep. that rush happens at the very end. But then it's like lazy filmmaking because you make these soft decisions. Like, oh, I think it's okay. Let's go with that for now. But then like a lot of times I think that training will kick in. You're like, no, this is, let's make the decision. <laughs> That's right. Let's do this. Let's commit. Yeah, I, I find working with directors and other people like that are of that mindset i find that just just more my style that like they they know what they want they they have that vision and they're ready to go rather than the, like loosey goosey stuff well, that's what I kind of like about um, working on set is that every minute counts. And, you know, if you go over, then suddenly everything is just going to bleed your budget dry just because every single person, including the stage, are all, you know, going into double time. So um, you got to make those decisions right then and there and every second counts. And whereas once you get into post, it's just like, la da da, you know, there's a deadline <laughs> in a few weeks. Like, let's just, you know, try a few different ideas and check them out in the morning. But for you, um, do you find like having condensed timelines like is that like a practice that you think people could apply to what they're doing even if it's like hey this is due a month from now how do i give myself these mini milestones even just to myself to be able to iterate quickly and get shit done yeah i mean self-discipline I, I find especially lately in my career is like the hardest thing to muster in a lot of in a lot of ways and but it's like that that the deadline like setting your goals and your deadlines and your milestones is actually i find that so important because it, it puts you back into that mindset of like all right i gotta get this done no matter what and i think it, it for whatever maybe it's a mindset thing but it turns that fire on mm -hmm. and it's like all right now you got to make these creative decisions now uh yeah i love that i love what you're talking about with, with that live action live action stuff it's so true <laughs> that's cool. i mean i've only had the experience a couple of times but yeah you're on the set and you see these guys running around with their heads cut off <laughs> and but things get done things get like it gets done and some of the stuff is, that comes out magical so that that's exciting yeah i definitely think like um when you put yourself in that situation that's when your best work comes out because you you you've got to have that laser focus and yeah i think that in a lot of times like with anything like even right now um giving myself like ridiculously tight deadlines for everything but the the big cuz i've i've done that 100,000 times in my life like give myself tight deadlines but when um the big shift I've had recently is give myself extremely tight deadlines, but the goal is to have it done, you know, not like, hey, I've got to get, you know, work on this for this amount of time and move on to the next thing. It's this needs to be done by this amount of time. And suddenly every decision you're making has to correlate with the finish line. And uh, I don't know, it's just for me, it's just, yeah, it's definitely a big mindset change that forces you to see results at the time when effective. Mm -hmm. And totally. um, do you have any, uh, to put you on the spot, do you have any other life lessons since we seem to be jumping onto those right now? Be yeah, I mean, I, others and treat them like you do yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, exactly. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> uh, well, okay. So I like the, the, what we're talking about. I just shot a live action short yeah. film in VR, right? And that was actually it's kind of because, be honest, man, it was trickling along for years. 
and years of just dabbling in the story, this and that. And even my other friends were like, all right, are you going to do this thing or not? But I just didn't feel comfortable at the time. And then finally, I think the, the right pieces fell in place. There's a little bit of serendipity there. And then we shot it. We got it done. Now we're in post. But to me, the, uh, that, 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 like, the discipline and the kind of like that passion, for whatever reason, you have to find a way to keep that burning. Otherwise, I just from personal experience, I will lose interest. And what keeps me going is is just constantly looking. At, maybe it's fear because I'm looking at other people's work and like, damn, that guy's really amazing. How do I how, yeah, how do I get there? Uh, but that that stuff, I guess to me, I let's let's spin it. Let's say it, that's to me, it's inspiration, right? You look at other people's work, and I get inspired by that stuff, and that keeps me going. Like, oh, I really really want to do what that person is doing, and uh, yeah. That that's it. I think if anything, it's don't let that uh, go away. <laughs> that's cool. Like, um, because you mentioned it earlier too about your first real job. Basically, that was a chance for you to learn and kind of sponge everyone else. Because you're like, hey, now I'm in this pool of people who've got all this experience, and this is a chance for me to to grow and to have access to you know stuff that I've I haven't had access to before. And do you find though in our industry, I'm just gonna say like all. Uh, creative industries like there's different personality types like do you think that everyone is going to see people who are better than them and be like wow this is great i get to be around better people or do you think that there's going to be different personalities who <laughs> react yeah to that? there's there's totally different personalities <laughs> I've, I've, I've come up with a couple like there's some that that love the teaching aspect and and the learning aspect and they're always trying to give back i think i kind of fall into that category the reason i do that is because people were super generous with their time when i was starting out like i would not be in the position i am today if it weren't for other people giving freely of their knowledge and for me and being receptive i guess and soaking that up like I would write down everything, go home and like study what they told me and the books that they told me to look at and stuff like that. <laughs> then I found other personalities. They're super gung ho, just as, you know, there's no judgment there. They're just as good, great and all that kind of stuff that they do. But they, 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 they have a singular focus and they don't really care about <laughs> anything that's going on. So they're not there to train anybody. They're not there to push anybody along and mentor and that kind of thing. And, and then you get everything else in between. But I think for me, it's it's finding, and that's why, you know, the, the website that we started is also to kind of give people that access to professionals that you normally wouldn't get if you're on the outside. Because it's, I only find that when you're on the inside, then there's a select group of people who have the knowledge that you want that, that are willing to give it. And, uh, it, you know, you make lifelong friendships in this thing. To me, I don't find, I, I heard, one guy when I was first starting out, I thought it was a cool thing. He said, this is a lifestyle choice. This is not a job. This is like a vocation. This is a masochistic, masochistic choice. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. Uh, and then, but then it, within that, I think just, you got to find balance too, so that it doesn't overtake your life and you become some mm -hmm. crazy lunatic doing these things. Yeah. So sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, I think in that vein, it's just the the the, the pa because you because you're doing this out of, out of a passion because you really want to. You know what? You don't want to get taken advantage of because some people will, you know, because you like working at this stuff will make you work 24 hours a day. <laughs> but then also uh, you don't want to burn yourself out, which can also be a reality in the, in the kind of things that we do and the, the hours that we throw in these projects. Right. That's right. Um, this sorry, I'm just writing something down. But um, yeah, I mean, just to segue for a second, but like, yeah, I had that epiphany recently where uh, I, I went to dinner with a couple of uh, buddies of mine and we all kind of had a quick conversation where it's like, all right, like, you know, no shop talk until um, all, the, all the girls go off to, you know, chat or whatever. And it's just like one of these things that it's, I had to stop for a second and think about that. And I'm like, the fact that you've, you've got a you know, no, no other industry in the world do does everyone get together and, and chat about your job like that religiously that you need to consciously tell each other like you know let's let's cool it with the the shop talk for a bit and I realize it's usually not me it's it's certain other certain types of people because for me I'm just like I want to talk about alcohol and partying and have a good time um, but you know it's it's one of those things that like uh, we we do you do need to be obsessed in these industries where. They take so much discipline, so much hard work, so much wanting to quit every moment leading up to getting in. And then from there, it's it's more about, you know, sink or swim a lot of the time too. And yeah, I mean, it is, 
it becomes your life. It isn't like, hey, yeah, this. it isn't a job. It's a career, I guess, to quote Chris Rock. I can't believe it. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it is. It's, it's essentially, it's, it's something that you've got to obsess over and you've got to surround yourself with it to really grow and it a part of, you know, to have that longevity. Yeah, man, I think that's the great thing about what you're doing too. It's like you're showing people that it's possible and that, it, you know, I think maybe for some people who, who have not had the opportunity to even work at a professional gig, like they don't even realize that, uh, you know, that, that you can, you can make it, but you know, everybody starts this way. I, you know, so I tell, you know, young guys when they're doing it, it's like, just remember that even the, the best artists out there that you can admire, they sucked at one point, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, maybe they were gifted when they were 14 or whatever, and they actually became good at that age. But even then it's like, they had to be trained and, and do this stuff. And yeah, you, you can make it and it, it can be a positive thing. <laughs> so that's, that's right. yeah, I, I think if, if anybody's listening to this and they're, they're doubting whether they should do it because yeah, they, they, they make more money at a, at a banking job or, or whatever, you know, they want that they think they should be doing. It's like, why, why, why sacrifice your happiness mm-hmm. for something because you have this fear of not making it or not being success, successful. You know? No, that, that's definitely become a common theme recently about, you know, whether art is a real job and, you know, Hey, I should go do something that's more stable. I should go get a career. I should quit this because, um, yeah, it's instable or, or I hear about all the, the fluff about visual effects is going down the toilet right now and all the other BS out there. And, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the thing is it's visual effects is a booming industry. And there's the, the, the flip side is because everyone has excuses as to why they can't succeed. It's like, well, I don't want to try because of X reason. And they give themselves that reason to validate why, you know, they shouldn't try in the first place. So whatever it's going to be, it's, it's just a placeholder for, it's an excuse basically. And I think that um, one of the big things is, yeah, that the industry, like, you know, there's too many people trying to compete out there right now. So I'm never going to be able to get my big break. And the thing is, it's, it's a linear thing where, yeah, there's way more people now doing visual effects, doing film, doing video games than there were 10, 15, 20 years ago. But the amount of jobs coming out, um, Thank, thanks Avengers, by the way, for like doubling the amount of jobs out there. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. But the, yeah, the amount of jobs coming out uh, every, you know, matches that like in a linear fashion. So when, when there's five times the amount of um, people trying to do this stuff, there's five times the amount of work, if not 10 times the amount. So it's definitely always work out there. So, yeah, that's a great way to put it. I, I always tell people too, like it's very, we have a really hard time hiring story guys specifically. I mean, I don't know uh, how the vision, well, I think I kind of know. It's also hard find good VFX people in, in, in every little discipline. In particular, I just know, I'll just speak about story, but it's like, you know, the guys that have the right training, who have the experience, who can draw well, who can conceptualize things, who can do previs and understand what a shot should be, is really hard, like few and far between, like find really quality people. And we need more of them. I mean, that's why we're, we're trying to train them. That's why my website yeah. there, Storyboard Art, is to try and help people get into the industry because we need more good storytellers and they're hard to find. So yeah, that maybe some people say that the market is saturated, but not where I'm sitting. I, we mm-hmm. need more people. <laughs> yeah, like I've been on projects where, um, yeah, we're we're struggling to find effects people when like some of the biggest studios in the world, and we're literally hiring juniors because we can't find anyone even like at mid level. And it's just like, are you kidding me? Like you know, I <laughs> appreciate it. Right. But, yeah. So yeah, I mean that means people are working. People are busy, right? That's yeah. Good. No, it, it is. It's so true. Um, and just to jump around a little bit, but like, um, I, I figure we will talk about Jonah Hex just for for a second. Um, Oh yeah, you know. But what was that experience like working on that project? That was awesome. That was another like uh, put out the fire kind of project because I got a call from uh, some guys in LA uh, who were working on that movie, and they said, "Yeah, we need to do this." They had to rework a scene, and we need all hands on deck. Can you help out? Yeah, oh, sure. And they actually wanted to do these these like really detailed uh, color storyboard panels, which I normally wouldn't do, but I guess they were pitching some execs that were <laughs> they really wanted to sell the idea. <laughs> And that, that project was super fun because it turns out that the director of that film was an old animation teacher I had in college. Cool. And yeah, and I remember this guy and he was super inspiring. He was an old Pixar guy who, who moved off and did, um, you know, to Blue Sky and all these things. And he really, I remember he really wanted to get into writing and directing, super witty. And that was his first live action feature. And, uh, you know, for whatever, everybody has comments about what they do, but I thought it was just, for me, inspiring that he made such a big leap into doing what at the time he was an animator when i met him he was teaching us animation to now directing these big budget 
uh, live action films. So that was that was a cool experience. Yeah, I mean the 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 work on it that I personally did was like rush. It's like oh my yeah. god, I got to rush, I got to rush and do it. And uh, I remember watching the film. Being, oh yeah, yeah, that's my scene. It's awesome. <laughs> so what was your scene? I've only seen the movie once, and I think I might have pirated some handy cam one. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, it's like you know, I don't really recall. The, yeah, the it was a well. scene towards the end near the climax where uh, Jonah Hex gets captured, and he's with the femme fatale girl. I forgot who played her but uh he's inside the ship there's like a boat and they have this big climactic uh moment there and they it ended up changing it a little bit but like he you know he escapes and then he fights a bad guy and then, you know cool. all that stuff happens yeah nice man oh that's great and we're going to talk about uh star wars clone wars as well so i mean what has your experience been like with that and um yeah do you want to talk a bit about how that happened and yeah that that's awesome that, that's been a really good experience and i continue working with those guys over the years because uh so i was at pixar and i ended that one and uh uh well that was just contract work so that the, my, my gig was up and then i got a call from some friends that i knew and this is another thing that i have <laughs> to, to touch on the life lesson is like you know make good contacts and networking and keep your friends tight because a guy who was working on clone wars you know knew i was available and he asked me for my portfolio and he ended up showing that to the the director there at lucasfilm and I got an interview and, and again, like that was the other thing there was, they were looking for story guys. They, they were looking everywhere for LA and whoever it was hard for people because to come up, we're, we're in San Francisco. So there wasn't that big a pool of people to choose from. And, uh, hopefully they didn't choose me because I was the only guy available <laughs> because I actually knew what I was doing. But, uh, so anyway, I got the job and that was, that was super fun because I had worked with some of those guys before and we became this really tight story group and and the guy who's running it this guy dave filoni who um he's a great guy he's a great storyteller he he loves to become a personality and, and he he worked directly with george lucas and he's the biggest star wars fan ever and so that was the right job for him and and that was an interesting project because george was was really executive producing the thing and if you know anything about the projects i'm sure you do mm-hmm. but the project that george lucas works on it's like he's always in the driver's seat so even though we were the the story guys and we traditionally would take you know the project into our own hands he would make changes like last minute changes and calls and you know voice actor changes and stuff because he could and he you know of course his goal was trying to make it better and he was having a lot of fun just mm-hmm. editing stuff and and like it was his little playground but uh eventually i think we got our 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 system down right and we were able to create a bunch of stories and i still hear people i yeah i would get like fan mail and stuff from people who would watch the show and i'm like i'm lower on the totem pole for that kind of thing and they would be like wow i love what you're doing it's way better than the films that george did and, <laughs> and i was saying like okay i guess that's a good compliment but that was an awesome project we worked at the ranch at Skywalker ranch there which for it's really unique because it was a tv show and like tv animation doesn't usually have the budgets that we had right and, and uh and to work at skywalker ranch and that kind of thing was was awesome we had a great time <laughs> no that's so cool um yeah and i guess for you what were some of the like challenges working on that project specifically and you also directed two episodes too right yeah I, uh, towards the end i directed a couple episodes and um uh on the rebels project it, uh, it kind of segued into another tv show but uh the to me that the challenges are always to to figure out the, the story part and then what was interesting when I got there, I actually asked, asked the people, the, the tech guys, the like the VFX suits. So I was like, so are there any limitations that we have in the story to actually get this this created? Like, is there like crowd limitations? Is there shot? Can we, can we do all these shots? They're like, no. Basically, we can do anything you guys think of. Uh, and at that moment, there was a big budget on the Clone Wars thing, so they could do all these crowd shots. They had another studio overseas that were going to do these things. So I was like, wow, we have all this this uh you know these tools available for us now now i can really go to town and make these like cool epic action shots i always wanted to do but then the the real challenge became how do we how do we the material that we're given because we're given a script that's you have to kind of stick to it because they spent all this money writing it uh so we had to turn that which the way that they were working there the scripts were were really uh especially the way george works they're really a first past they're like a first start <laughs> so then we take that material we create the artwork and then we put it up on reels and we look at it and that's when the second pass really starts <laughs> and you like rework it go back to drawing board fix things and then you work that whole process back and forth till you come up 
you know, to basically to hit the deadline. And I didn't realize that at first. So that was like, I had to change my mindset. of be like, oh, okay, you know what? It's not the way I was used to, which was like, you're given a script, you do the script, and then there's no change. You had to give yourself permission to actually, you know, have a creative say in it. Yeah, and I would, I would get frustrated at first. I'd be pissed off. Why did you change my work? Like, I did all, spent all this time doing it. Like, no, really, you think about it, we're trying to make it better, and you're changing dialogue, and you're changing this is so that you get scenes that are completely tossed out. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I like that scene. But no, really, what we're trying to do is make the whole a better thing. I think that was a cool little lesson I learned. That's cool. That's really cool. Um, yeah, and no, I think it's really cool that you actually get to have that creative input because you, you know, there are projects where it's just like sit down and you you do the job and you shut up. Um, but it's <laughs> actually, especially something such a big IP. Um, and a lot of the the other work uh, was being done in Singapore as well, right? For yeah, they were they were outsourcing. They had their own Lucasfilm studio they set up in Singapore that they were outsourcing animation and, and lighting and color to. And the guys were good. Like they, it wasn't the typical like outsourcing thing where they're trying to like cut corners. They actually were trying to build up another team, uh, and they they did quality work. Like at, you know, just like any project, I think it was really rough at the beginning. Like it wasn't quite the style and colors that we wanted. And then eventually, I think you can tell really that the quality improved towards the later seasons, and that's like The Simpsons and <laughs> yeah. any other show, you know? Right? Yeah, yeah. You get the so they, they're doing some some good stuff, and I think now the stuff that they're doing on the Rebels animated series is uh, is even tighter. Like I think we got the pipeline down, like the, the the tech part, the colors, the explosions, all the the ship, you know, battles. Uh, they, we've done it so much that I think they they know the the pattern and they know how to do it in a mm -hmm. cool way efficiently it's cool and uh right now can you talk about what you're currently doing because you're you're working at one Lenderman drive at the moment aren't you or yes yeah. so I, I'm, we're finishing up uh, season four of uh, the rebels animated series mm -hmm. so that has also been a cool project because dave the same crew and it's actually we're all of like <laughs> we've been there now for like almost well in and out i've been in and out but some of the guys have been there continuously from clone wars until now which is like almost a 10-year run for for some yeah. of these things and so we all know each other really well we're pretty tight uh which is good and bad we become this family and uh, with all the dysfunction and stuff there too <laughs> <laughs> but the good part is that rebels project had um had a, a much tighter what i what i liked because clone wars never really finished out if you guys follow the, the thread you can see that the like season just kind of fizzled when they when they uh when they just cut the project but this rebels one has a, a pretty tight thread that came at the very beginning that they're we're following this this group of rebels and and ezra and stuff like the main characters and then at the end we're we're continuing this thread and we're going into season four which um they've announced that this is going to be the last season so the way it unfolds i think is going to surprise a lot of people uh and it's going to be yeah a really cool a really cool thing that's awesome that's really cool man um yeah it's really funny the, like literally this happened last week uh i got a bunch of uh, uh letters in the mail and um one of them though, i'm just flicking through and it's just like a regular envelope had a business address up the top left one letterman drive and i think it's like building b and i'm just like wait that that's ilm okay i'm like all right cool so I open it up <laughs> but I, I was just kind of confused because i'm like they don't have my portland address and it wasn't like it was being forwarded. But I open it up and it's this spammy, um, <laughs> like, you know, ex uh, br you know, bring your credit up to $100,000 or, or whatever. Um, you know, you get a loan for this much money. And it was just this obviously spammy letter. And, and I'm just thinking like, you know, was this a s just like some credit scammy thing that I got, but coincidentally had the, the address of ILM on it? Like, or did they open it? see that it's because it's clearly some shitty thing it's like multicolored a fake credit card little thing that <laughs> right. and i'm like so it's either one thing like i i don't know what or option b is that someone there opened it up was like well this is clearly a piece of shit but i better forward it on to alan because i'm a dick and repackage it <laughs> with, with their letterhead and, and mailed it off but either way I'm, I'm completely confused by this but it's just like no one in their right mind would would think that this is valid mail that i should be receiving that's worth re you know forwarding on to me but i was just open it up like all right like is someone a dick and just wanted to forward this to me or, or what so yeah. <laughs> right. that's awesome but yeah, apparently I'm approved for one hundred thousand dollars you know, for for a loan. So yay! Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's so cool, man. And I guess to jump around a little bit, but like you mentioned uh, Pixar earlier, what were you working on there? Uh, I was there when they were transitioning from the the first Ratatouille film. Like uh, like I was there during Ratatouille, I suppose. And they they just like did a big whole story transition. They brought in Brad Bird. So I was kind of there in that transition period, and they had me working on um, 
uh, in the tools group, which is like the, the story tools guys were developing a new pipeline of how they're doing. Cool. So I was, yeah, it was, is that, that was a, a new experience for me too. And actually, you know, I'll, I'll date myself was that was the first time they put a Cintiq in front of me. And I actually, I was like holding out for the longest time. and be like, Oh, you know, I'm just going to draw on paper and be a traditional guy. And they put this thing in front of me and Pixar and like, okay, well, I guess this is the future. I might as well use it. And, uh, so then I started doing all my stuff digitally there. Uh, the, 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 the cool thing was, and this is another thing that I guess, uh, I don't know, just to tell people, but I, the guy that hired me at Pixar was another animation teacher that I had back in college. And, I, he remembered me and uh you know i don't know if that was the reason i got the job but when in their interview like i was like oh wow hey <laughs> and we kind of uh, you know reminisced a little bit about the old mm-hmm. school days but uh, you know i guess just i didn't he didn't remember me as a dick or somebody that like wouldn't do the work so yeah i guess he gave it <laughs> a chance and that was uh yeah it was just a nice to keep that connection there and uh uh yeah and the the pixar experience was awesome i mean the I know a lot of people dream about going to Disney and Pixar. When I was a kid, I always wanted to go to Disney. And, and mm-hmm. A lot of people now want to do Pixar because of, of all the films that they do. And it really is magical when you're there. The places I always thought it felt it felt like Disneyland in a lot of ways. And I mean, I'm sure you've been there. But like you walk there, everything's nice, and you hear like yeah. birds chirping. And you're like, is, is this real? Am I in the real like world here? It's you just like, you, you oh, know that you're uh, you're loved when you go to fucking swimming pool. <laughs> You know, in a bathroom. Yeah, you, you know, there's motion in the bathroom. It's like, wow, this is pretty nice. I, yeah. You know, I, I arrived. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. And you're right about that. I mean, again, I think it's such a critical point is the more you network, the more, not only the more people you meet, but the more you actually put in the effort to um, to stay in touch and, and build those relationships. Like, it's so critical. I mean, th- there's nothing more reassuring whenever you walk into a studio just to have a quick chat, you know, because I, I also feel like most of us don't have jobs interviews you go in for a chat it is a bit different if you go into like ilm or pixar where it's such a very hierarchical so there's a lot of people who you know pick their teams and and everything else but in general for the most part like if you're going for a quote-unquote interview it means that you've got the job we're just checking you're not insane or you know you slap someone else's name on your reel and um but yeah i mean like the more you work the more you network the more you build those relationships like i've lost count of the times i walk into a room and literally everyone at the table is just like hey Hey, you know what's up? And, you know, shake hands, like how's so and so? What have you been up to? And yeah, it's just like you know, you you know, you got that nailed just because you're part of the you know, you've got a continuous family of people. Like wherever you go, you've worked with like ten of those people before. So it's just like, oh great, this is you know, the band's back together. Like, what are we doing now? And, <laughs> right. Um, but right. it's it's so critical, and uh, yeah, I, I think that that is so powerful. And if you are a bit of an introvert, and you know, being you know, building those relationships is difficult. Like, I, it's worth it it's worth getting out of your comfort zone and trying to at least make a few um, people that you go along well with on certain jobs because they're going to go elsewhere and you're going to go elsewhere and you know um the more you guys keep that going the more it's like yeah you've got this connection to every single studio on the planet it's yeah it's so mm-hmm. valuable yeah just get over it i mean yeah. we're all kind of nerds and geeks at heart so might as well just just let it go yeah i think you're going to find there are a lot more like-minded people at these places than than not yeah mm-hmm. you make more lifelong friends there it's, it's 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 actually pretty nice so which studio is cooler uh to walk around in ilm or pixar in your opinion wow <laughs> <laughs> you know i find it it's like the great gas street. there's like old money and new money right <laughs> it feels like pixar is like new money they got flashy colors and they got mm-hmm. big toys they got giant posters you're, you're right. like ilm it's like you're a little kid it's like oh my god slimer and, et and you know <laughs> yeah and yeah it, so it's a different vibe and especially at, at the ranch, when we were at the ranch, it's like everything is just, mm-hmm. there's like, there's like a lot of like, uh, it just felt like you're in a museum. It's like, it's very like, like good taste. Like, I really appreciate, I didn't know this, you know, I always talk shit about like other places I didn't know when I was there. But when I actually stepped on the ranch, I'm like, oh, wow, George has really good taste, man. This guy knows how to yep. build the nice buildings and like beautiful paintings and like everything is just really pristine and beautiful. And then, and you go to Pixar, it's like, oh yeah, fun, huh? Yeah, I love and all that kind of stuff. So I, the different vibes, just as cool. I, I think Pixar has a cool thing where if you ever walk in the animation department, the animators have taken that over and it's like their own like shanty town with <laughs> just 
everything you can imagine. There's like, there's a bar, there's like people have set up their own like window dressings and they've decorated the interior as if they're their own house. Uh, that's really cool. And then if you go to, um, you know, ILM and Lucasfilm, you see all this, this, the cool effects and these robotics and just, yeah, these things that you've always seen in, in these movies, but you never knew how they were done. Mm-hmm. And so they, they both have very cool things about them. Yeah. Worth, worth seeing both of them, I think. No, totally. Um, no, I, I think it's really cool. I mean, for me, ILM is just like anytime I'm in town, I'm, I'm always catching up with those guys. But like, um, and yeah, next time I'm in town, we'll have to catch up. Absolutely. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just a walk down your childhood, basically. It's just like, all right, like there's, you know, all, all these things that I grew up with. And yeah, I don't think there was ever a day where I wasn't just like, fuck yeah. Um, did you uh, did you ever go to the archives at, uh, at the ranch? Did you ever have a chance to do that? Uh, no, whenever I went to the ranch, it was usually go, go, go. We all, you know, it wasn't like we, um, like it was either for a screening or, um, you know, for lunch and things like that. So it was never like got time to walk around and check things out. But why, what was it like? Oh, I mean, anyway, well, I was just going to say, that's the one geek out moment where you go there and you see the original Death Star and they have like all the matte paintings and there's original Ralph, Ralph Macquarie illustrations. Like he was one of the head designers back in the day and the original Indiana Jones notebook and all of these props oh, yeah. that are there and it's all in this climate controlled room and they pull these things out as if it's like museum archive. <laughs> just blown away. I was literally blown away. I was so hyper impressed by, you know, I'm the art geek. So like I love yeah. Ralph McQuarrie stuff. And it's the matte paintings that they had. It were just spectacular. I mean, hopefully your, your audience knows what a matte painting is, but back in the day they used to paint the background, the, you know, the, the, the VFX shots, right, on glass. And it was, these are the huge full-size things that they did depending on the shot. And they're expertly painted, just the most beautiful things ever. <laughs> that was blown away. Yeah, kid in a candy store, basically. That's so cool, man. And to loop back for a second, and I'll be respectful of your time. I know it's uh, it's getting on, but um, you, you mentioned tools. And I, again, I always think of... Um, uh, this one situation with Stephen King where, um, you know, he's doing a and a with his audience and someone's like, you know, what kind of pen do you write with as, as if that <laughs> is going to make them a better writer? You know what I mean? But but um, so you mentioned the first time you ever used a Cintiq. For you, like, are there any tools that you really love? Like I I did an interview with Nikolai Lockerson. Uh, we were both speaking this year or last year. I think it was this year in... Um, in over in Europe, we're doing a talk, and like he he basically paints all of his matte paintings on an iPad Pro these days. And another one of my buddies, Matt Conway, uh-huh. he's um does a lot of matte painting on iPad Pro as well. And so a lot of people are kind of leaning in that direction. But I'm kind of curious, like for you, like what are some of the tools that you've kind of found to, to be really either just naturally you know great brushes and great way to work, or uh, you just find it's great because you can carry it around with you. Like what are some of the tools you typically use? Yeah, I like. Uh... Yeah, I like to geek out on tools too. Like we 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 do a, a hybrid now of like when we're doing pre business storyboarding. So we'll use we use Maya and like they have proprietary software at Lucasfilm for doing pre biz. And but we can incorporate drawings with that. So then we'll actually do Photoshop and we'll do just you know two D drawings and bring those in as cards and push those around in three D space. So you get this this cool like uh, you know parallax effect and stuff. Uh, but when I when I do my storyboards and I, I i really go back to like the traditional like 2d style way of working so i really like using uh tv paint which is a, a french animation software animation yeah 2d animation software but at, in the most basic level i think the one that i like for for just drawing and sketching is uh is sketchbook pro from autodesk mm-hmm. it's actually a really simple program and but i find the drawing tools are, are really really nice um the other one that's pretty popular is, is toon boom and uh, because they have is that uh, still around? Yeah, they, they oh. well they have Harmony, which is their animation software, which is all right, and then they're now I think which is getting popular among the story artists is uh, Storyboard Pro, and they uh, the cool thing about that is you can do the sketches and you can also create your animatics in the same program. You can time it out and then export a movie and stuff, which is a lot of people are doing that now. You create the reels. I think that's like the 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 going way to, of doing it, right? It's that. It's not just doing individual panels anymore where you throw out a JPEG image or something. You actually want to time it out and create your animatic uh, and then show you know show that to your director and stuff like that. Um, but then as far as equipment and stuff, yeah, I do use a Cintiq. I also carry around like a Cintiq laptop. But the one thing that you mentioned, like the iPad Pro and just like these tablets that are so portable now, mm. um, I think my next computer, just because I've been working on a PC for the longest time, will be uh, will probably be a uh, uh, Surface, Surface Pro. 
Yeah. Yeah, like the small Surface tablet because it's super portable. It's got, you know, PC programs I can use. I can put Maya on there. I can put Photoshop and stuff. Um, not that I'm against Mac. I love Mac and Apple uh, UI and stuff like that. But I don't know. I just I think for pro stuff, it's always going to lean towards the PC. I have a friend uh, who <laughs> I'm not, I don't know if I should mention this, but anyway, he he he's done. Let's say he's done work for Apple, but the work that he had to do couldn't be done on a on a Mac. It had to be done on a PC. <laughs> so it was kind of ironic, but yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I like all Mac tools, but um, I always found like when I had my MacBook Pro, uh, which I'm kind of glad died recently. But yeah, <laughs> I, I feel more illiterate on a Mac than I do with a PC. With a PC, because I'm I'm definitely all touch, like using a keyboard. It's just I can close my eyes, I can navigate around, do whatever I need to. And um, yeah, with a Mac, it's kind of like mm-hmm. I got to think and be like, all right, like click the button, and you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's just because I don't use it enough. But yeah, it's just kind of funny that that's meant to be the easier to use one, but because I'm so accustomed um, PC. I, I have a harder time even just doing the most basic stuff on a Mac. So go figure. Um, mm-hmm. And do you want to talk quickly about your short film? Oh, yeah. So recently I, I shot this uh, VR narrative short film that um, I was experimenting a lot with VR once it got hot around here. And I had a couple of friends who were doing some things. And I thought uh, some people were doing VR storyboarding. And I thought, well, none of that seemed very logical to the way they were doing it. So I figured, well, why don't I do it? At, you know, I kind of claimed to, to be a story guy. So uh, I I had this project that I was tossing around for the longest time. It's about this, this street performer who can bring his imagination to life. And he ends up helping this frustrated artist and kind of unlock her, her artist block and then and get some some inspiration herself. And so we got together with uh, a really great cinematographer who was doing a lot of VR stuff. And he's uh, actually an ex-Google guy. And we decided to shoot this short film in San Francisco. Uh, the, like I said before, I think I mentioned the story. It was like lingering on for many, many years. But all the pieces kind of came together. It got some really cool actors and the visual effects piece and all the people that are going to help me out on the back end. So um, to me, the exciting part was like, okay, we, we did it. We actually created the project from scratch. We thought of it from scratch. We It's not like this the typical like suicide idea or somebody's going to die or there's blood everywhere and fights and action. Like this is really kind of a, a whimsical a piece. It's like, there's a little bit of a love story. It doesn't actually turn into romance, but there's, there's, it's a more of a colorful thing that we're trying to experiment with. And the whimsical part happens with his magic and imagination. So we're going to have to composite in on a technical part um, in VR, a lot of these visual effects. And we also shot it in stereoscopic. So you know all about this, but, um, to us, it was experimenting with these tools to make sure that we get the camera set up right, that we can be nimble. Like we had a couple rigs that we were shooting with um, that because that was the other thing in VR. I see all these projects that they're just the camera is locked because they they want to hide the cameraman and they can't push it. Like it's very difficult mm-hmm. to move these big things. But we were able to create a rig that had uh, two uh, stereoscopic VR cameras or well, it made it stereoscopic by having two of them. We just put them in the right arrangement. And then we had. Um, uh, two black magic cameras that we could shoot traditionally with the lenses on. And so now we have a couple of choices when we're, com- we're combining all these things and creating the shots. So I think this is going to help um, when we're doing the narrative part. So to me, that, that's that got to be right, uh, aside from all the technical things. And if we can get it uh, so that it's engaging for the viewer and watch these things in a more traditional filmmaking fashion, but we got that added piece that you're surrounded in this in this environment, in this VR environment that you can kind of look around. I think uh, that'll be the hook. And so we're we're now in post production, and we're hoping cool. to finish in, within the next six months or so. Um, I should also mention that the sound design that we're doing, we we did use like one of the top top of line Sennheiser uh, VR mics to record everything, and. This is all going to be like an experiment. We're putting this together. We got a lot of pro people, but we're kind of breaking new ground here with this stuff because we, when we were shooting, we're like, okay, how do we do this? <laughs> and we were asking around all these people, and these are like some of the top guys. Like we had guys at the Sound Sennheiser Lab who had ne- never shot. With, I mean, they obviously know how to use the microphone, but they hadn't shot in the way that we we're doing with this stuff. So they're actually interested in knowing and how this project will unfold and come through. So. Anyway, I think this will be a, a fun project. I'm going to let the storyboard art uh, uh, community know about it when it comes out. And hopefully we're going to have a, a, a typical launch so that we make a little bit of splash and we show some people. But it's just yeah. it's just really it's a humble piece. It's like probably about five minutes short. But with all of these added pieces of technical 
things like the VR and the special effects and then the, the sound design. Uh, hopefully that will make it interesting enough for people who want to watch. No, that's so cool. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd love to pick your ma- brain more about it, but I think that uh, what will be better is I'll have you back or, you know, one, once the, the short's out and we can kind of um, start talking more about it. But yeah, I mean, that, that's so cool. I, and you're absolutely right. I honestly think that if you're not breaking new ground, then the, the fun just isn't there. And like, I've got a film shoot I'm doing uh, tonight and... I've literally, like, I've, I'm going to be pointing it out later today, but it's just for me, the fact that I'm like, yeah, at 2 p.m. I've got scheduled to start planning out the shoot that we're doing four and a half hours later. And just because <laughs> it, it's not breaking new ground, it's like, all right, the same shit that I've done a hundred times. So, um, you know, it, it takes a lot of the uh, the thought process out of it. When you're actually doing something, it's like, shit, we got to go do some tests on a macro level to figure out how we're going to do this so we don't screw it up on a much bigger scale later on. It's, you know, I think that's where the, the real fun is. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Good luck on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. And uh, two more questions just really quick. But like, yeah, I didn't realize that you would actually put out a book. Uh, I think that's so cool. Um, so I'm just curious about that. Like, when did you kind of get the idea to work on a book? Something you always wanted to do? Or was it one day you're like, fuck it, I'm going to teach the world how to do storyboarding <laughs> my way? You know? No, it was, it, was, it was actually very random because, uh, I mean, I had been doing like courses and lectures and a little bit teaching locally. And then out of that spurred the website that we have, the storyboardart.org. But um, it was just very low key at first. We kind of had a slow build up. Then uh, another artist friend of mine, um, Anson Jew, was already uh, talking with the publisher, uh, Focal Press, to doing a storyboarding book just to highlight like kind of the unsung heroes of filmmaking because not many mm-hmm. people may, or many people may not know what storyboarding really is or does and that kind of. So he wanted to highlight some pros that are working in, in LA um, on, on movies and stuff. And he's an old star Wars guy. He's, he worked at Island too. Um, but, uh, he couldn't, he was so busy. He couldn't finish. He's like, Hey man, I know you're doing these lectures and things. Would you be interested in, in helping me write this book? And I was like, sure. Uh, I think, you know, I, I wasn't that busy at the time and just kind of help him out. So I basically kind of took over the project and I compiled a lot of his notes and then my notes and we, we, collaborated together to create the book um you know professional storyboarding rules of thumb that was the title that the publisher <laughs> came up with so i didn't have that much say in there but i think what i did and what was really cool to get the feedback from people was that we talked about things that that they i think are usually not uh often touched on in in the, the pro side of things is like rates how to get jobs how to, to put your portfolio together obviously the technical part of storyboarding and then we we highlight like the personal stories of people who are actually doing it. And I think that mixture of stuff, uh, people responded to really well. So we've gotten a lot of really uh, positive feedback from 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 doing that. I, 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 it was it was really hard. I mean, writing a book is actually difficult when you're you're trying to work at the same time. But I think that experience um, also led, led us to build the website up more. And also uh, we're planning on doing other other things similar to that. That's cool. Soon. Yeah, I was curious, like, um, yeah, I guess, like, what was your experience putting the book together? And, like, you know, I, I was imagining, it's funny because, yeah, Focal Press, they've, I've spoken to them a bunch of times about doing book deals. And um, over the years, it's just, at least from a financial point of view, I, I've changed my perspective completely on books. Uh, I, I think it's an awesome idea. But back, like, earlier on when you're looking for an ROI, for me, like, I had so many conversations with public, uh, publishers about, um, you know, just about all the royalties and everything else. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, look, this is what I'm doing with like D sales or, or whatever. And this is how much you guys are making from books. And, you know, for me, it's just like, it, it just didn't make sense to ever do one. But um, plus also I had like Focal Press asked me to do a character animation book at one point, which I'm like, dude, if you <laughs> looked at my resume, like I animated <laughs> Max Steel back in the nineties. That's about it. Um, right. But no, I, I think that like the big thing though, is that doing a book, I imagine is a lot of fucking hard work. I mean, uh, for you, what was it like? Like, how I, I'm just kind of curious from for my own sake, but like, yeah, um, what was the turnaround typically on, on doing something that because by the way, I actually just bought your book on Amazon. Oh, oh thank I said, you. I said, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Uh, no, I was just flicking through it. I'm like, this is great. So, um, yeah, I, I think that even for me, when I'm not typically gonna, you know, I might do a few napkin sketches, but I think that just you know, the just looking at more of the composition and like a lot of the, sub, the subjects around that, like, yeah, I think that even for what I do, I think it'd be so valuable. So uh, it's just like, hell yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to check this out. But um, going back to my question, what was, yeah, what was the turnaround like for, for that? What were some of the challenges? They, I, I think that you could apply that to pretty much any project. Heck, right? Yeah, anything. And I think that was what Anson was struggling with is he had uh, so much on his plate just doing his pro work that he needed backup. 
And so when I came in there, the publisher had set out, and I think that's smart on their end, they had these milestones. So they would do... Mm-hmm. Were, Telling like, you compressed deadlines, you're going to... Get yeah, that. right? Going back to what <laughs> Life lesson. <laughs> is that they set like these six months milestones and there was like a rough a rough draft and there was like the I think there was a second draft and then maybe a, a third like editing pass that they actually brought in an outside editor to look over grammar and things like that. Um but then this book because it was so visual, I mean, um we had to I had to actually create images for this. So it was like a I treated it like a job. The yeah, writing real part production. Was, yeah, the writing part was hard for me too because now I like to write, like I, I, I think I'm okay at it, and so that I wasn't scared of that part. Um, but I did have to set, I also be disciplined about setting a time. Like I, I think I every night I would come home and I would write two pages a night just to get in in the flow of things. So you know, if you do that, let's say five or six days a week, you know, you have a good batch of pages at the end. And I had my own notes that were very loose, so then I bring those in. So there was a there was a process to me, but I had to really sit down and like time out and, and schedule out my output as if it were like a storyboard gig. Like, okay, I got to do so many panels today, or I have to do so much, so many script pages in a week. This time it was like, okay, I have to do so many actual written pages in, in a week. And then combined with that, I actually had to create the images for it. So I would go back and forth doing it, but it, it literally took over a year. I think uh, there, it wasn't consistent, but it was like six months uh, milestones that were like loosely spread out. Then there was a break, right? You I was just back. about to ask, like, did you take a break just for your insanity? Yeah, well, yeah. it was a break because they had to review it. And then right. Back. Then, uh, then you did the second pass, which actually was easier because once you had the first, like, go at it, it actually got easier to do the second thing. And then uh, and then by the end, compiling, it was just, like, doing fixes and, and adjustments here and there. Uh, I think, yeah my, yeah, my advice for anybody doing a book would be, one, just to have a really tight outline so at least you know the topics that you're doing. I think that was something that really helped us on that. And then, then you can elaborate from there and do all your research because part of the issues that I think we had was just organizing the information that we wanted to put in the book. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff we left out just because they had their, you know, the publisher had their limits and, and requirements. In fact, they, they thought it was going to be a black and white, more simple book, but they ended up turning into a color book just because some of the examples needed that. You know. That's cool. I can't wait to check it out. Um, so finally, uh, I just wanted to bring up storyboardart.org. So, I mean, do you want to talk a bit about that? I mean, um, when did you get the idea to set up that website? And do you want to mention a little bit about the website and what it is? Uh, yeah, well, storyboardart.org is a is a you know online community of visual storytellers. And basically what we do is we help people and we train them to be uh, professional story artists. The emphasis is there on visual storytelling and how to get into the industry and learn the things that you need to know to, to do that stuff. So you can, you know, because of my discipline, you can go the traditional story route and become a, a story artist developing stuff like that. But I think what we found too is that the techniques of visual storytelling go into any discipline. So even if you're a you know, animator or a lighter or, um, you know, any discipline in between that, VFX, whatever, that if you know how to, the final product of how to construct a shot, good composition, like what the story flow should be, like story structure, beginning, middle, and end, all that kind of stuff, it will help your your discipline. Like there are lighters that need to know how to tell a story because their light will affect the emotional point of the shot, right? So everybody within the filmmaking industry should know about story. And that's what uh, we've gotten some really good feedback about that. And so I just found one of the reasons we started is because I started doing these lectures on storyboarding and storytelling and stuff. And there's a lot of that out there, but I found that the information that I needed to learn as a story artist was not easy to get. Because it's not just it's not just story structure. It's not just uh, illustration. It's like combining all of that so you can create uh, images and um, and really tell a story in, in images, kind of comic book style, right? Um, it's much more than that with previs nowadays and other things. But at any rate, so we we found that there was a need for this, and we built up this community. And little by little, it was like our first go at this stuff back in 2008 was very crude, and uh, we had a lot of great support. But now that we've built up this thing, we have a much more streamlined blog, and we have um, a lot more resources. We've been doing these online events, and uh, every so often we'll sponsor these these uh, courses and. A lot of it is pulling from the community of artists that we know. This guys in there, like um, some of our teachers are, you know, Pixar guys, and we had a Oscar-nominated artist, uh, Robert Dolly, who's been a, a San Francisco friend. He's, he's an amazing, amazing artist. Um, so these guys will come on and and 
I think to get access, that's the other thing that we're, we're trying to get people to get access to these types of talent is, is very rare. And mm-hmm. so uh, we want to kind of let, you know, the, the barrier to entry kind of come down <laughs> a little bit more. Um, and, and, you know, our goal really is to help people improve their storytelling and their skills. So with that, you can do a bunch of things. You can, you know, you can either take our classes and you want to go all the way and really dive into the, doing the pro stuff. Or you can just um, follow the resources and materials if you need reference, if you need, like, uh, to have an idea what an artist should get paid, what uh, professional practices are. So that kind of stuff I recommend. This is my little pitch, but <laughs> go to storyboardart.org and check it out. <laughs> no, I, I think it's so cool. And like, I, I do like um, the fact that you do have that full spectrum. You got um, you got resources for people who have been doing it forever, and usually they're the ones who are going to struggle to be like, look, I already know all this crap, but like to actually have a place for them to be able to grow that extra bit. Or I find people who are more senior uh, necessarily looking for more guidance. They're looking for, you know, as you mentioned, um, other people who are doing what they do so that way they feed off of each other i think that is so valuable but then you've got you know more the more the beginner but that way no matter where you're at you're able to kind of find your path and get on that road and then work your way up to another iteration so i think it's really cool and like a lot of the content resources you've got on on there too are things again uh it's so far and between that you would find that stuff online like you know how much should i charge you know as an artist or uh all, all the other valuable resources so i think that's so cool to have it all in one one spot yeah thanks man we're, we're definitely trying to follow your lead with all the stuff that you do as well and uh I, yeah <laughs> <laughs> just a bit just a bit no but I, I think uh the more people like like do this stuff and they find these resources out there i think the better the industry is going to be so Absolutely. hopefully they you know it's out there. The information is out there. You just gotta you gotta find it and take it. What if uh, some of your students like? What kind of results uh, are they getting as well? I, I, again, like, I'm not doing this as a plug. I'm actually like, uh, you know, I, I think that's really cool that there, you know, there are some resources like yours that are more laser focused, opposed to just you know popping up. Um, you know, this this month's CG Society is a three week course on insert random subject, but actually instead having that long no, but- you know what I mean? And I, I think because you've got that community, it's more you know, something that builds over time. So yeah, I'm just kind of curious, like with a lot of your students, like what kind of results are a lot of them getting? Uh, I mean, the the ones that I, that I remember that I think are super cool because they'll come back and write us. It's like guys that get their first job mm-hmm. and that they, they're they just super excited that they were able to do it. And, uh, I, you know, I, we definitely can't take all the credit, but at least they, they say we had a small part in that. A couple of like one of the guys, uh, I remember I did a portfolio review for them and, um, uh, he was he was from Canada. He was a, he was essentially a foreigner trying to get a job in the United States, and he was good. He had good artwork, and he was just a little bit disorganized. And I said, okay, do this, do that, make this, you know, put this in there, work on this stuff. And he started applying to studios, and he got a job at Nickelodeon within That's a couple great. months. Yeah, and uh, he wrote back excited about that. But I knew, I mean, I knew it would happen because you just gotta. He was good. He could. He knew what he was doing. It just needed a little more focus. The other ones that I find. Um, really fun is that people who <laughs> who don't realize that they that they can that they have the skills to do this stuff like there was one guy i spoke to recently who uh was studying like i, f- I forgot what it was like uh it was like economics or something like uh completely unrelated <laughs> to mm-hmm. storyboards story time Back yet he job. loved drawing <laughs> he loved animation and he had really good drawing skills and i said well what are you doing doing this studying this stuff and, you know, what do you want to do? And he really did want to get into um, animation and art. So I helped him a little bit, again, like focus his portfolio that way. And uh, and then, uh, yeah, he, he landed a gig at, at Titmouse in L.A., which is an animation course. So that kind of stuff I, I think is really fun to hear. And then, we, you know, we get other people that just they, they appreciate, maybe they're not going for the career-minded thing, but they appreciate the information and that they – they're applying that to other stuff. I get graphic designers and stuff who say, wow, I never really understood what to do with visual storytelling. And this is uh, it was like eye-opening for them. So that that positive feedback keeps us going because honestly, mm-hmm. when we first started, it was like crickets out there. I didn't realize that people needed this and we're, we're kind of filling that hole in this, in this niche that's mm-hmm. there. That's awesome, man. That's so cool. Yeah, I'll I'll leave it there. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, is, is there any life lesson seems to be the, the big theme that we keep going for over here. But I mean, yeah, I, over your many years of working, um, do you feel like there is any other advice you want to give to people? I mean, you, you mentioned burnout before uh, being one of them. And also just, you know, I guess, what are some of the things that you think artists typically struggle with? Yeah, I think uh, just touching on that kind of stuff, I think there's a I always say it's a marathon, not a sprint. Like if you think of this as a career, and I didn't really understand this when I was first starting out, is that like there's there's a you got to pace yourself when you're doing this stuff. And the burnout thing, the burnout factor is real. And I thought, you know, at first I could go like I would work nonstop when I was like younger in my 20s and my early 30s. And now, like, I, there to me, there's got to be much more balance of like other things I'm doing in my life that also inspire me, and then just being able to con- keep that passion going because it's burned out. Like that passion has gone away a couple times in my life, and I don't want that. Like I told you before, I was a, when I was a kid, this is the only thing I wanted to do. So now, when I'm older and I can't do it anymore, like what? <laughs> how? Yeah. how the, what am I going to be doing with my life? It's like I've lost that. No, I, I don't want that to happen. So I. I, I want to create a lifestyle and a balance where that I'm doing things that, like you're saying, you're breaking new ground and you're learning new things and that keeps me inspired. But at the same time, um, you can keep it consistent. You don't want to like go all the way and then you lose energy. Some people can do that. I don't know. I guess I've, I've met a couple of people that they just have this unbelievable, like they can just go like the Energizer Bunny, but I, that to me right. is very rare. <laughs> We'll just to jump on that for one sec, but like I've I've seen yeah the flip side of that where um, you're right like there's some people who are just absolutely obsessed with what they do like so much so that like there's a guy I worked with he's a VFX soup at a very big studio which I won't mention but like I remember his now wife had to say you're not allowed to bring your laptop on our honeymoon when they got married and he literally was on the laptop as soon as she was asleep he's under the sheets which to me just paints this picture of like just obsession like bad obsession where he's hiding under the sheets with his laptop doing 3d you know after he gets married which is just like what the fuck is wrong with you you know what i mean but but when you have that um yeah i didn't think about it till now but like you get some people who are a little bit too passionate where it's and the worst part is especially in a leadership role when you have that level of of obsession and you expect everyone else to exactly the same way as you are and you feel like you're leading by example and it's just like no like they're you know not everyone needs to be like you and i think that um yeah i mean there's there's burnout then there's the other way where you're just literally obsessed and it is your oxygen you know and and (laughs) right neither is healthy i mean i think balance um is by far like you know having those escapes like i do think that if if you're not doing what you love for a living then you're you're going to end up doing it in your spare time anyway so it's better to quit economics and go study what you're passionate go work in what you're passionate about because that way you gain that fulfillment in your day-to-day job in your living like how you make your but it means that from there in your spare time you get to escape that and go find the things that are enjoyable like spending times with the people you care about or doing way too many tequila shots whatever it is that you enjoy but, <laughs> right. but you want that escape from the thing that you love rather than escaping the thing that you hate you love with the other side yeah, yeah. Uh, it uh, yeah i couldn't agree more it's that 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 balance will 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 keep that fulfillment like i one of the things i looked up to is just kind of the old guys in the industry like people who've been there for like 50 years and then I just, I see them, I, I want to get there. I want to get to that point. Hopefully I'll get there. Is that to just be alive to be around that long. But like, it'd just be this old guy. He's got this knowledge and maybe <laughs> at that point I'll just teach and pass it on to other people. But I think it's just so cool that they're so seasoned and they know what they're doing. And they, like, I've met a few people like that. Just to tell you a quick story. It was uh, one of the guys that we, he was a guest director on Clone Wars and he was George Lucas's old school buddy. And he was also a filmmaker director in his own right. Uh, this guy is, you know, like in his 60s, late 60s, 70s, I think at the time, he put us all to shame, man. It was so awesome. This, this guy coming in and he, he never touched 3D in his life and he destroyed us all with his like, <laughs> which is his knowledge. He just knew how to shoot and his, his knew how to create story. And I was like, wow, this dude was so awesome. <laughs> it was great. I want to be that guy. <laughs> That is so cool, man. Well, I'll leave it there. Uh, it's way too early for us to be suffering in the morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, this has been awesome, man. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, catching up. And when I am next in town, I'll, I'll definitely you guys up. We can go to the final final or something, I hopefully a bit more classy. <laughs> cool, man. Uh, actually, I always like the pig and whistle on Chestnut a lot more. Like, the final final was not, besides for the World Cup, stuff like that, it's not really my, my <laughs> Right. <laughs> cool, man. All right, well, it's good talking to you, brother. Well, good and, luck uh, on your shoot. Yeah, and uh, yeah, thanks. And we'll catch up. We'll catch up cool. soon. Thank you.
Okay, so I hope you enjoyed the episode. Again, thank you to Sergio for taking time out to do this. This was an absolute blast to sit down and really chat to him about uh, everything that he's been doing and everything that he has done in the past. We'll be diving right back into the boot camps pretty soon, but next episode is going to be with Brandon Jarrett from Disney. He's a technical director who's worked on a lot of really amazing projects, such as Moana, Zootopia, Frozen Fever, and Big Hero 6. So um, the cool thing about Brandon was just talking about how he went from school and his whole strategy of going directly from school into Disney and just knocking out amazing stuff and kind of being a bit of a prodigy um, throughout his uh, early career and just kind of working his way up. And I kind of find it interesting because I'm obviously someone who loves to freelance. I love to manage multiple projects in a given time. I'm definitely a hired gun. And I've never really done the career thing. If I ever have, it's usually for companies that I own or I'm managing. And yeah, it's kind of interesting when I do sit down with people who've had the very linear and kind of slow and consistent career. And I don't mean slow in the, the sense of not being ambitious, but being focused on working your way into literally one of the biggest companies on the planet and working your way up and kind of having that persistence from day one to be able to focus on something and be able to make headway and continue to make headway all the way through. And I think it's really impressive what Brandon's done. He's definitely built a name for himself and he's definitely built uh, a lot of niches even within Disney for himself. And we talk about that too, even in the sense that even at Disney, he and other people have been very careful about not getting him pigeonholed in certain areas where he's had a lot of success and even won awards and technical achievements for, it's still something that everyone's conscious about. Like, okay, just because you've done amazing at this doesn't mean that we want to cap you and, and stick you in this as being that person. And we're going to continue to allow you and push you to evolve. So there's a lot of really great stuff we get into with this episode. Um, that being said, I will leave it here. And I'm working at the moment on getting another boot camp out. So these will become more consistent. Uh, I think me being sick and having the free training, the hardware guide, which is coming out soon, the productivity book, uh, which is out at the moment, that'll be in the show notes, uh, and the free training and everything else, as well as being Christmas, um, it's just been pretty killer. So I'm, I'm amazed that we managed to get the first boot camp out. And I definitely want to try and make that a consistent thing moving forward and tackling specific subjects uh, each month throughout the year. And uh, the feedback has been amazing. So um, at the same time, if you have any recommendations about things that you specifically want to cover, let me know. I know for me, I, I really want to cover um, a few particular subjects like branding. I want to go really in depth on confidence um, as well as networking, which I think some people probably associate that with being the most boring thing in the world, but really it's the key to a successful career. It's probably more important than your actual talents, which really sucks when, when um, you say that out loud, but it's, it's so true in so many uh, circumstances. So there's so many things I want to get through and really it's about equipping you with the tools and the skills necessary that throughout the year, as long as you do the work, you're going to continue to evolve. And I love the fact that we are doing not only podcast episodes, but also videos, tutorials, uh, as well as having a guide that comes out with every single bootcamp. And uh, I'm still working on finishing up some of the last videos for the first bootcamp I got behind. Um, but, you know, all that stuff's coming. And um, yeah, these are things that I'm really excited about. So I will leave it there. I'll be back in the next episode. Until then, have an amazing 2018 and rock on.